Let's take a look at um, working with Eagle and uh, begin by entering, uh, you know, just opening up Eagle and taking a look to see how, see what the first window you, you see is here. So this is the Eagle environment. Um, what's shown here is the control panel. And this has where you place all of your, um, all of your projects are listed here. Uh, the libraries, which contain all the parts, are listed in this area, and that sort of thing. So uh, I'll, I'll go through that a little bit, but I think right now what I'm going to do is, um, is go and generate a new project. All right? Or maybe before we do that, we'll just take a look at the libraries. This is, these are all the libraries that come with Eagle. Well, and there's probably a few extra that I've added in. Um, my own. See, so here's like my own. I copied the whole analog devices library and and made my own edit, edit, editable version or something like that. Uh, scrolling down a little bit, if I type in E, I'll come down to the E section, and here's my Engineering 301 project library that I, I mentioned. I'll post as well. Uh, one thing, you know, so you can see what parts I've stuck in here. So there's those are those two transistors I mentioned I I, I put in here. So there they are. Uh, this shows you in the library, you actually get to see the, um, let's see, I can close this a little bit and bring this back here. You actually get to see the schematic. If you click on a part, you'll see its schematic view and its board package view, okay? So uh, we'll be working with both of these things. Keep that in mind. Anytime you place something on a schematic, it has an, uh, an associated board package. Right? So one particular schematic part could actually come in multiple various packages. So we'll see kind of how that, how that works. Um, here's the other transistor. I put it in an OP275, so you'd have one, and some other things. So take a look at those things when you get a chance. I'll post the library very soon. One thing to keep in mind when you do download the library and put it into this, into this folder, uh, to do so, you... you I think you just want to make sure that you copy it into, like if I'm here in my finder, uh, I would go to Applications and Eagle. And in the Eagle folder, then you can go to the libraries. So this is where you want to copy the .lbr file that I, that I give you. So you're going to put in, so there you can see it right now, is the Engineering 301 Project Library. All right, <clears throat> so uh, you download it, put it in that folder. All right, and one thing to keep in mind is that um, when you put it in here, you, you may not see this light as green. You have to um, enable the library or make it available to Eagle Schematics, and this light needs to be green for, for that to happen. Okay? <clears throat> so click on it to do that. You just click on it to do that. Mm -hmm. in, this, in this control panel here. So <clears throat> I'm going to, in my Engineering 301 tutorial folder, uh, I'm going to make a new, not a new folder, I'm going to make a new project. And projects come up as a, as a red folder. And I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to say, well, uh, Engineering 30101 um, Fall 12. Okay. And within my folder, I now want to generate a, uh, a new schematic. You can start out just making a board without any schematic, but we're gonna, do, we're gonna do it from the approach of making a schematic and then creating a board from that schematic. So here's the schematic page window here, and this is where you edit um, your schematic. <coughs> Shows up as blank, and the first thing that you're gonna notice is that um, there's this cross mark down here. And notice that up, up here in this, in this area, it tells me what, what position I'm at. So this gives you the coordinates. This, um, this cross marks is the origin of, of Eagle's schematic area. And so it has the coordinates uh, 0, 0. If you want to add parts, we'll kind of, we'll, let's you know, browse the, um, the menus up here. You can, under the edit, menu. Here's all the things that you can do. Add, change, copy, cut, delete, some other things. Incidentally, these are all 
um, shown here on as buttons that you can just click these things. But <clears throat> what's much more handy, and in fact, also the draw commands are all right here. So we'll get into looking this draw, a uh, net, a wire, a polygon. We'll look at these things and what they're used for. Their, their, their um, tools are, are shown down here as well. And uh, what's nice, though, is that up here, there's a, a command prompt. So you can type in the names of these commands instead of having to go and click on them each time. So if I want to add a part, I can type in add and hit enter. And it launches the, um, the part searcher, the uh, part search window here. So this shows all of the libraries. Keep in mind, it's only going to show active libraries, ones that have, have, that have been turned on or enabled. And the first thing I want to add is a frame to my schematic. So I could go and search for frames in here. The, um, the search is definitely case sensitive. I recommend using wildcards in that. We can take a look at that in a second. But I often just stay in the whole library window once I get used to it a little bit, and I, um, I look for the letter of the thing I'm looking for. So I want frames, so I, I go for F, and I can actually type in the whole FRA, FRAM, and it jumps right to frames. Okay, so all the frames are in this folder. You can see kind of what their, what their um, schematic view looks like. I'm going to do a, um, a frame L, or frame A L. So it's eight and a half by 11 inch landscape. That would print out on an eight and a half by 11 uh, piece of paper, you know, one for one. So I kind of like to use that. You may end up using something a little larger. As it turns out, the Eagle student version uh, only allows you to do one schematic page. So your power supply and your left and right channels will all be in one whole schematic frame. So you might go for a bigger frame, a larger frame, something like this, this EL. It's got 33 by 44 inches. It gives you a lot of space to work with, or, or 22 by 34 inches or something like that. But for now, I'll choose this. And uh, now I can place that in here. I recommend working with a mouse with a scroll wheel on it because scrolling out zooms out. And scrolling, you know, scrolling back zooms out. Scroll, uh, scrolling in zooms in. This is a very handy feature. Uh, also uh, worth noting is that clicking on the scroll wheel and then dragging around moves the entire um, workspace around. All right. So um, I'm going to place the origin of this, or place the frame at the origin, just because that's kind of what I, I like to do. You can put it anywhere you want, but that's that. So now we have a frame here. And the frame just says, kind of right now it says untitled. I haven't really saved this yet. I'll hit save here, and um, this is untitled schematic. I'll say uh, engineering 30101 uh, fall 12 tutorial. All right, so now I've saved it. Notice this hasn't updated. If I zoom in one notch, it'll update. It'll redraw the frame, and it'll show me the, um, the name of the file and uh, the date and the time in which I last saved. All right. So now we can look at adding in some parts. And uh, I'm going to add in, we're going to just add in a few resistors. You're going to do a lot of passive components. So one library I want to show you right away is something called the RCL library. This has resistors, capacitors, and inductors. And uh, in this library, you have a bunch of folders. The ones that say EU are. Uh, European, European style, and uh, the ones that say U.S. are, are U.S. style. So uh, <clears throat> that's for uh, for capacitors. You have the same thing for resistors. In in Europe, they do more of just a straight box. Here in the U.S., we have kind of the squiggly line setup. So I'm going to choose a resistor. And notice that I have the same schematic symbol each time here. But when I scroll down to various, to other parts, I'm getting a different package layout for the board, right? You can see the leads change, the size of the resistor body changes, right? So this is something to keep in mind when you're choosing parts. I mentioned at one point 
and I'll mention it again, that when you're building your schematic, this is a good time to have Mauser or DigiKey or, or um, whatever, wherever you're going to buy your parts for open and start making sure that you start adding the parts into like a shopping cart or a shopping list of the things and the sizes you need exactly. All right. With resistors, it's, um, it's pretty straightforward. Most of your resistors are going to be a uh, quarter watt in size and um, this size 0207 is the size for a quarter watt. The 0207, by the way, stands for um, the dimensions in millimeters. So it's uh, two millimeters in diameter, I think, by seven millimeters wide, I think. Pretty sure that's what it is. Now, these other markings after the slash, or these other um, numbers after the slash, 02077, 02010, 02712, what's happening? The leads are getting spaced out further. So this slash here tells you the lead spacing of, of how the component plugs into the board. Notice that it also displays this information to you down here. It says the grid is 10 millimeters. That means that the leads are spaced 10 millimeters apart. 10 millimeters, um, or actually I should say that for every 2.5 millimeters, that's 0.1 inches in spacing. So if you're used to working with a breadboard, 10 millimeters is four breadboard spaces apart. And turns out to be a fairly, if you're laying resistors down horizontally, it's a pretty good spacing. If you need to save some space and you want to mount your resistors vertically, you can use this, um, these slap, anything with a V on the end of it means for mounting the resistor vertically. So um, this right here mounts, the one end of the resistor goes in the board and then it, it mounts vertically and then wraps around and comes down. I think there's some examples of that in some of the circuit boards around here. You can take a look if you wanted to get a visual on that. But uh, <clears throat> this is handy for saving space and I'll show you how to, how to move efficiently between the two of them after you've already made your board so that you can um, leave the resistor schematically connected but you can change its package type once you've already generated the schematic. All right? <clears throat> Nick, is that grid um, hole to hole, basically, on the board? It is. Like, uh, grid two and a half millimeters is hole to hole. Now, the, the, the holes don't have to be spaced necessarily the same they do on a breadboard on, or on perforated board. When you're making a PCB, you can put them anywhere you want. But you don't want to do so too close because, um, <clears throat> you know, each of the pads, each of the holes have some solder ring around them. You don't want those to overlap. <clears throat> but, uh, but yes, that is that 2.5 millimeters, you can think of that as just um, one breadboard spacing to the next. All right, so it's, it's important to try and keep these metric measurements, give, give, um, you know, keep a, a visual in mind of, of what you're dealing with here. All right, so I'm going to go for a couple of, uh, of these horizontally laid resistors here. And so I'm going to say OK, and then I'm going to add them in. So I can go in and just add them in. And once you're adding a certain part of a kind of type, you can just add in as many parts as you want. So I'm going to do R1. I'm going to, um, I'm going to right click to rotate the next one, R2. I'm going to right click again to do another one. I'm doing some kind of resistive T network here or something like that. And we'll put a couple of other ones down this way for whatever reason we have. We'll use them at some point. All right, so I've made some resistors. I can hit escape to go back into the um, RCL library. And I don't know what I want to do at this point. Maybe, uh, maybe right now we can add a, a, a couple of capacitors. I'm going to do a polarized capacitor here. And uh, we're kinda, we'll kind of look at designing the input stage to like a voltage regulator or something like this. And there's all these, when you look at the polarized caps, look at all these different types. One thing I want you to notice is that these are shown in red here. And look, it also has these letters, SMD. This stands for a surface mount device. We won't be dealing with any surface mount devices. Um, everything we're going to be working with is through hole. So you want to keep scrolling down until you get down to, here you go. See, these have green holes right there. And... Uh, <clears throat> Those, those are for through-hole type components where the leads go through holes in the board. 
and you can choose various, um, let's see, we're back in SMD. Yeah, these are, these are probably pretty good ones here. You can choose various packages. This tells you, one, it's got a grid of three and a half millimeters. That's the lead spacing on the capacitor. So when you shop for capacitors, which have a much wider variation than do resistors in, their, in all their package types, you want to look for, um, you want to make sure the lead spacing matches your component that you have. You also want to make sure that the, the package housing, the, the total footprint of the device fits in, within the diameter of your, um, of your package, of your layout on the board, right? So I might have something that has three and a half millimeter spacing and it has a 10 millimeter diameter. Then I want to use this part. If it's less, if it only has eight millimeters in diameter, then I want to use this part. The outline helps you keep track of how much board space you're using, right? So you, you want to you use that so that you don't come and stick some other component. Like if I have the 10 millimeter spacing here, I want to know how far this capacitor sticks out so that I don't put a component right here next to it, you know, it, and um, cluster the whole situation there. So I'll, I'll use this package, assuming that I've sourced my capacitor on Mauser or something. It does have a 10 millimeter body, and I'll put that here on the input side. I'll put one here on the output side of, of the regulator as well, and we'll just kind of leave it at that. So I haven't connected anything yet. I'm just kind of placing some parts here so far. I'm going to go ahead and stick a regulator in. And um, you can, let's see, let's, let's put a, a voltage regulator in. You can get one from the VREG library. That's, that's one where you can get one. I also recommend downloading, um, oh, it doesn't show here in mine. I know it's there, though. The, uh, anyone familiar with SparkFun Electronics? Any, nobody hear of that yet? Yeah. You've, heard, you've heard of it? Um, yeah, so they're, uh, they're a company that... Uh, well, they sell sort of instructional solutions and some, um, some pre-made circuit boards and things like that. They have some good stuff. I recommend checking it out. A lot of stuff with microcontrollers and sensors and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> incidentally, their whole company started as, a, I think, like a, a senior project or a master's project or something like that in their university of Colorado or somewhere like that. And it really took off. They, they seem to be doing very well. But uh, they, they have their own library of parts. They have Eagle tutorials as well. If you're interested in browsing their site for another tutorial on Eagle, you can find one there. Um, they have their own library, a SparkFun library of Eagle parts. It's pretty good. It's fairly well put together, and you're allowed to use it for, um, you know, uh, for your own personal use, not for anything that you're going to sell, I think. And they have a regulator in there that has a good layout. That's why I mentioned it. But here, we have the VREG library is already installed in Eagle. And um, I think I probably gave you some better regulators than they have in here. These are, these are 78 LXX. I'm going to do, you're going to end up using a, an LM317, which is a variable or adjustable regulator. And you'll notice that, that each of these have, have a certain package, right? There's all these different packages, but they kind of have the same. Like, there's a 78, we got a TO3 package. We've got, um, we've got, this is a TO220 package. Uh, I recommend using this, but you can also, if you want to use heat sinks on yours, which I'll show you from the 301 library that I've created, uh, you can use that, which is actually from, I pulled that from the SparkFun library. And it says, 78 MXXS for standing, that it's standing. Sometimes they'll, they'll have a V on them for vertical. But the difference is, look, this, this one here shows that it's, um, that it's laying down for, with an L. Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't do that because that takes up way more board space, right? To, to just kill a bunch of your board space by laying this big, bulky TO220 package down on your board. It's fine for some designs where you have the room uh, you won't have the room in this project. So those are those, those um, packages. I'll go to the Engineering 301 library and see I've put in the V1 uh, or VREG 317 library. So this is um, an adjustable uh, positive output. You can see the description says SparkFun Electronics. So I pulled the, the part from their library and stuck it in this library. And now, what I like about it is that it's standing, 
So this is a, a standing kind of package. And this outline is for where a heat sink would go on the package, which is useful if, um, if your linear regulator is dissipating a lot of, lot of, lot of heat, a lot of energy, uh, you want a heat sink on there. So you can use this if you like. We'll, we'll use it today just to kind of see how it goes. So I'm going to place that part. And now I've got a few different, um, <clears throat> different pieces here. So I'll, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll use this as an, as an example. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Let's do, let's do this. So now that I've got some things placed here, I'm going to type in net. I'm going to use the net tool to connect these together. Always use the net tool. Don't use the wire tool. The net tool allows me to connect one device to another. And as soon as I've made the connection correctly, it's, um, the connection is established. To verify that I've made the connection right, I'll type the move command. And now I can click and drag on this and move it around. And you see that the wire, the net, stays connected. OK, that's very important. We can type net again to connect something else. What I want to um, alert you of is that you can click on a net. And if I don't drag this exactly to a pin, and by the way, I'm getting these other kinds of wire types by right clicking. OK, and you'll notice that it's, it's scrolling through these settings here. Right? So if I want a right angle like this, I can do that. If I want, if you can do something curved if you like. Get kind of artistic or something, um, but uh, but usually you'll 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 be doing just straight angle things. Um, sometimes on the board you can use the same kind of tool in drawing lines and routing things on the board. Then this is kind of handy, but um, a lot of times you'll just go for right angles. But what I want to point out is that if I bring this to somewhere and let's say let's say look I go over the pin. This is where I want to connect it to, right at the end of the pin. I have to connect it there to get the connection to go solidly. Um, if I connect it further, let's say I pass the pin, notice that it's still trying to keep going. And um, the way the net tool works is if it's made in a, if it's established a solid connection from one point to another point of, of you know one device to another device, uh, you the um, it won't let you keep drawing the the net. Whereas if if you haven't done that, I can keep clicking over here and and doing all kinds of things. And, since I haven't terminated at another device, it assumes I want to keep going. So let's say I, I didn't know that I had done that. I hit escape. And now, just to show you, I can move R1 around. And it's, it's not connected to that at all. all right? So we'll back up a little bit here. And, um, and uh, whoops. No, that's not what I wanted to do. And we'll, and we'll make this connection here. So. Now, notice that the, the net tool disappeared. I made the connection successfully. Kind of connect this one. Look, I got a junction point here. The net tool disappears. The connection successful. All right. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to kind of connect the rest of this up here. And, uh, and we'll just sort of, let's see. Let's move this part over here a little bit. Um, notice that I have this text right here. If this text is getting in my way, the tool you want to use is called Smash. You smash a device, it, it, I know it's a funny name, right? Um, it allows you to move all of the text that's associated with it independently of moving the device. So notice now that these have little crosshairs on them. That means that I can pick them up and move them as I, as I need to. So maybe I'll put that up here. Um, and I'll put this one up here as well. Okay. <clears throat> So let's let's move let's move this resistor around. Let's say I needed another resistor as well. I forgot that I needed an extra one. I'll, I'll use the copy command, and uh, and I'll place I'll, I'll click on on R four, and then I'll I can place another version of it here. I want to show you that again from another way. Eagle, this command this command prompt thing is is based on a verb noun um, setting, and they talk about this in the uh, a verb noun approach. And they talk about this in the Eagle documentation or in the tips for beginners. But I can type in the verb, move, and I can type in the noun, what do I want to move, and, um, or, or copy, if that's my verb. And it'll do that for me. So I can type in copy R4. And um, can only with a name can only be used in the library. I guess you can't do that for copy. 
I know you can do that for move. R4. See, now it's already ready to be, to be moved. I didn't have to click on it. But I didn't know you couldn't do that with copy. So. Because, it, because it doesn't know what to rename it to? Or well, it picks the name for you automatically. Um, it'll just name it the next resistor that it can. Um, it said something about do doing it only in the library window, but that's OK. Anyhow, uh, we'll, we'll copy the resistor the, the other way and, uh, and do that. Now, adjustable regulators need some, some reference voltage here um, as, a, as a fraction of their output. So that's what I'm tying in here. I have one thing left to kind of, one major thing left to include is, is ground for the system. All right, so let's put in a ground. And the thing to watch out for, the ground symbol comes from the supply library. You can either pick, there's two supply libraries, supply one and supply two. I like supply two definitely for, let's yeah. see. Yeah, this is fine. I usually use supply two, mostly because I like the way they show these, these voltage symbols, these power supply symbols. It looks like um, kind of what I, what I used, how I used to do my notation in, in 353 and that sort of thing. All right, so <clears throat> we'll talk about putting on a, a power supply symbol in a second. First, we want to pick a ground. And the important thing is you have to stick with one ground. Once you choose a ground type, it needs to be the same throughout the schematic. What I recommend doing is choosing a ground, because look, there's all these other grounds. You can have an analog ground, a digital ground, ground, ground one, ground two, ground three, ground four, ground five, physical earth, right? <clears throat> um, it depends on what you, I mean, sometimes systems, complex systems have multiple grounds in them. For us, we're going to have one single ground, and I'll just use the ground symbol. This is kind of like a European style ground as well, but that's okay, I'll use it. What matters is that I keep it consistent. So now that I'm placing it, I can place it anywhere that I need to. And, uh, and this will be all set for me. I'll, I'll put a few of them down. You can also tie them all to one common point if you like. But now that I've got them there, I can tie these, 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 these uh, circuits down to, uh, down to ground here. OK, so we'll finish um, making some of these nets here. <clears throat> Move C2 kind of over here a little bit. Move this guy there. Type in net and finish up some of these connections. So now we've got a little bit of a regulator. Let's say that this is coming from V in or something. And I want to I want to showcase that that this is some output voltage. I can add in a. Um, I want to add in. Let's see where where are those. Um, I wonder if it's, it's in the supply library. Is it? I don't think it is. It's in the... What is that library? Hmm. Well, I'm blanking on where I would um, put this put this part in, but uh, <clears throat> at, at any rate, we can just add some text to say this comes from uh, 12 volts AC or or some <clears throat> or not AC some some DC supply. So if you type in the text command, you can you can um, type in you know I don't know uh, un unregulated DC source something like that. I could change the size that I want this to be. So make it a little bit larger. <clears throat> I can change what, what net I want it to show up on. Um, nets are assigned colors as well, but if I wanted this to just be like info, for example, it'll show up as gray. <clears throat> All right, so we've, we've kind of placed that just over here to, to remind us that uh, this is coming from an unregulated DC source. And now we can we can say well we've regulated the voltage depending on the values of R1 and R, R or R7 and R4 would change the the um, voltage of the, the regulator's voltage here. We can show um, how to how to change the value of a component or enter the value of a component. 
type in the value command, click on it, and you can say, well, this is a 1K, this one's a, I don't know, 500, 500 ohms, this is a, a 2K, whatever it is. <clears throat> this is um, 10 or, I don't know, 400 microfarads. So you can give everything a value if you like. And in fact, you should do that for to keep things clean in your schematic. Okay. <clears throat> and let's say we want to throw in a, an LED or something. Let's throw in an LED to, to show power is on. So I'll go to the LED library. Um, the library I usually use, I believe, is here. And let's see. Review those. Oh, here we go. LED five millimeter. These are um, these are five millimeters in size. Ten millimeter is pretty jumbo. It's very very big. These are these are smaller LEDs. I'll do a five millimeter LED. Put that on. I don't know. Right here. Uh, move this resistor over to it. And um, <clears throat> you know what? I'm going to show you how to do this a different way. Let's delete this last resistor. I don't I don't think I need it. I'm going to make this LED power this LED circuit. But first, I want to um, I want to give the this um, this node right here. I want to label it as as what voltage it is. Let's say it gives me 15 volts, like like how you guys are going to use. So I'll use the supply library from supply two since I like the symbols better, and I'll say this is plus 15 volts. I'll add that on here, and now all I need to do is connect this net to it. And it asks me, do I want to merge the net segment onto supply net plus 15? I say, yes, I'm good with that. So now this is a supply net. <clears throat> Anywhere I place this symbol, a connection will be made from the output of this regulator to wherever I place this symbol. All right, so now I can copy this symbol over here, put this and do, do a net tool to finish my, my LED circuit. <clears throat> And now I have an LED circuit that's separated, but it's, it's connected and powered from the output of this 317 regulator. All right? It's a very clean way to organize uh, sub-circuits in, uh, in your design. So this is probably enough information to just get you started with schematic entry. Um, do review some of the stuff, that the tips for beginners. But now that I've done that, I'll, I'll hit save. And I'm going to type in the word board. This is going to generate, a, if you already had a board made, this would um, open the board. Note that if you already had a board made, you should always have the schematic file and the board file open at the same time. So the documentation, the Eagle documentation talks about this, but there's something called consistency between the, the um, and as the name suggests, you want to keep the design, the schematic, and the board consistent. All right. <clears throat> so if you if you do something in the schematic while the board file is closed, like you delete a part, then the next time you open the board file, there's not consistency between the two, and you'll get an error, and then you can't do a lot of essential functions um, if consistency isn't. Uh, that's that's it, after you generate the board design for the first time. That's after you generate the board for the first time. So if before you've made a board, you can do everything you want in the schematic without a board open. Um, then you can type in board to make a board and then uh, get started. I will say this though, <clears throat> I would probably recommend building a little bit of your schematic and then starting a board file and then moving a few of the parts around rather than doing the entire schematic and then going to start on a board because when you do that, you'll start on the board and you'll have a ton of parts everywhere. You have to keep track of what's what. If you do it more incrementally, You'll have, uh, you'll have a chance to say, you know, there are fewer components on there. You can group them more easily. Because I have mentioned component placement on the board, and that's a really important part of a quality layout. The idea being that these resistors, they service this IC. So this is a sub-network that should stay together on the board, right? The, this voltage regulator shouldn't be all the way across the board from R, R3 here, this resistor. That just makes it for an unnecessarily long trace, and that trace eats up board space, and it makes it harder for other traces to be run later. 
and it also isn't isn't quality design. So I recommend kind of something like this. You build the power supply and then start the board and then go over to the board and work on it. You had a question? Yeah, I think I have a question. Uh, do you get the standard library inside of three or one Or is it a separate library? So the 301 library I just I made. And I'll, I'll, I'll post it on iLearn. Okay. And then you just download it and add it to the existing library. All of those, almost all of those other libraries are included by default in Eagle. There's a few that I've made my own of my own stuff. There's a few that I've downloaded from, from the web and that sort of thing. But almost all of it is included um, in the standard version. So we'll type in board and... I get a message saying, oh, you don't have a board yet. Do you want to create it from the schematic? Yes, I do. Here's my board. So now you're in the board editor. All right, there are two kind of different um, programs or windows. I have my few parts here. And this is what a, one of the reasons I recommend starting early is now there's only a few things to worry about to placing on the board instead of a whole slew of parts. Notice that there's... Um, Small air wires, as they're called, in um, connect, showing the connections between each of these, right? So this shows you how things are connected together. It's useful in reminding you what parts are connected locally with other parts, all right? <clears throat> um, if you don't want to see them, there's something called display. You can either type in display up here or you can click on this, and this allows you to turn on and off all the layers that are available in Eagle. The air wires are on the unrouted layer. And so if you deselect them, layer 19, you don't see them anymore. All right. Let's say you want to see them, but you don't want to see the values. This one that says T values, those are values that print on the top of the board. And you can turn them off. You no longer see the values of these resistors. When I'll turn them back on, we can, we can see them. Okay, there's the values, 2K, 1K, 500, and so on. Okay, <clears throat> so now I have my, this is my board area, this, this area here. I can reduce that by, which I'm going to do for this demonstration, make a really small board by clicking on the, by typing the move command and clicking on the top line, bringing it down here. I can click on the, on this bottom, or this right line, bring it over this way. And, uh, and now I'm going to try and make a board that fits on this small little space. How big is it? Well, here's the origin, and here's the upper right-hand corner. It's 1.35 inches by 1.4 inches. So we're going to make a board that fits on that. All right, so we, we get started. We start moving components onto the board. For the, for, the, for the full version of Eagle, I can move them wherever I want. And I'm OK. For the student version, you have to move them from here and place them on the board. It's, it's irritating, but that's, that's how the student version works, at least um, as, as I remember it when I used to use it. So I'll place these on here. Maybe I'll put this regulator kind of over to the side so that the heat sink can stick off the side of the board a little bit and take up a little less space. Um, <clears throat> let's see. How did this look in the schematic? Let's look in the, um, let's look in the schematic. Remember here, the schematic said, well, power came in on R1, was divide, you know, some kind of voltage divider with R1 and R2, and then um, current limiting through R3 or something, and then that feeds C1 into the regulator. So let's, let's assemble that part of the, of the circuit here. So we said power comes in on R1. I'll, I'll bring this over here. I'll just try to put this over here like, like so. I'll think that my power comes in this way. Um, then it feeds R2. Now look at this. This is what the air wires are handy for. See that? I can rotate this part around. Would I want to stick the part like this? No, right? I can rotate it around, and now I have a, one short, clean connection between here, between R1 and R2. Or, oh, I'm sorry, that's R3, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> that's good, too, because they, they both make their connection, right? So here's R2. That's going to connect down to ground. I could put it just like that. That looks pretty good. Now, here's that handy um, outline of C1 reminding me that C1's pretty big 
I can't stick stuff that close to it. So I got to move this out of the way. Not only do I want to move it out of the way, but I want it closer to um, the input of this regulator, which is tying to that pin there, right? Now, notice that R3 feeds into C1. If you look on the schematic, R3 kind of is filtered by C1 and then feeds the, um, feeds the, the uh, 317 regulator input. I could, um, and when, when you see it here in the schematic, the air wire shows it going from R3 to VN on the regulator to C1. So there's, there's no, um, Eagle will show you, show you air wires that don't necessarily reflect exactly the order of connections in the schematic, but it's all the same node. So really, when Eagle draws these air wires, um, it, it will place them as close as it can. Without, it's, uh, well, what I should say is, until you do something called rip up all the connections and then redraw them, it, it will show differently. But we'll, we'll see that in a second. So I've got these here. Let's put it like this, because I know that, um, that this is going to feed here and then it, basically I can hit R3 to this and then into V in on, on that guy there. And maybe, maybe I would even turn this around, something like that, so that V in is even closer. I don't know. We'll figure it out. We'll just play around with it. And then C2 filters the output voltage. Okay. That's great. So I'll put that something like this. And then there's the, the LED that is connected to ground and, and the output here. Remember um, R6, what, what, other, what other things do we have here? Oh, this is the resistive network. R4 and R7 are the uh, biasing network for the um, regulator. Remember, if you look over on the schematic, uh, they bias the adjustable terminal, R4 and R7. They need to be close to it. So um, <clears throat> I need to make some room for them to sit in there. So let's, let's get them in there as close as possible. This is getting kind of crowded, but... Um, We'll do the best we can. And as you start looking at all these air wires crisscrossing over here, you think, oh my god, how is this ever going to route? Um, <clears throat> do you, it, it, the auto router actually works pretty well. If you take these kinds of considerations and, um, and try to get pins close to one another, it does a pretty good job. So um, we'll see about that. We'll see how that works. If you don't pay attention or, or give any regard to how, where you place things, the auto router will not route your board 100%. Uh, You'll be left with a bunch of traces that you have to manually connect, which isn't the end of the world. And sometimes manual connections do a lot better job than the auto router, it turns out. But, but you can get the auto router to work nicely if you work with, um, work with it and help it along. All right, so I don't know. So I'm just going to place some stuff now kind of just to show here we've got some things done. And we'll just see how this how this works out here. <clears throat> so now I've got some things placed. Uh, the first thing I can do now that I have it placed is uh, I can. You can also use the smash tool in here if you wanted to. Um, like I don't know. Let's say I wanted to not have the value of this 400 microfarad cap show underneath where the cap is going to sit, but I wanted it to be still visible after I placed it, I can do something like that. Okay, so the smash tool works in here. Um, all the move things, move, uh, move R4, and that sort of thing, that just shows you this stuff. If you wanna know about the, the part, you can type in info and click on it, and this'll tell you about the part, its position, the angle it's in. Um, it'll also tell you the, should tell you the net. Huh, that's interesting. You can type in the value here if you want. And, uh, and that sort of thing. <clears throat> All right, so let's look at, finally, let's look at rot routing this board. The auto router is invoked by um, typing in auto. And uh, you get some options here. The, um, <clears throat> I mentioned that you can do multi-layer boards. Eagle supports up to 16 layers. We're just doing two layers, the top layer and the bottom layer. These lines here say what preference you want the, the traces to run on the top layer and the bottom layers, respectively. So default, it's set that, OK, the top traces are going to do their best to run vertically first, and the bottom traces will run horizontally. 
that doesn't mean that they only run in that direction. It's just what's preferential for the auto router when it first tries to, to route your design. This routing mill is important too, or the routing grid. When it says mill, the units means um, uh, let's see. Um, I think thousandth, th thousandths of an inch. I don't think it's millimeters. Hundreds of an inch. Hundreds of an inch? I thought it was hundreds. I think it's thousandths of an inch. Um, this is the grid on which traces can be formed? Yes. This is the grid in which traces can, um, can run. All right. So decreasing this value will let the auto router, uh, sometimes you can decrease this value and, and you can get um, the auto router to make more connections if you have a very crowded design. You can also run into problems if you decrease it too much. And the auto router will it'll make really bad traces that have a bunch of zigzags in them and things like that. Does it have any effect on the width of the trace? It doesn't. And you can affect that, and I'll show you how to do that in a second. So let's just use the default settings. We'll say OK. And um, done. Notice that this says 100% finished in here. This is very important. You want to make sure that you have 100% routing before you submit your board, right? So otherwise, things are, are left unconnected. <clears throat> uh, we can see kind of how things have been run. This, this, this was routed just as we expected. Notice that some of them show up in blue. Some of them show up in red um, or sort of brownish. Uh, the, the brown or red is, is things that run on the top. Blue is what's run on the bottom. So if you want to if you want to show um, if you type in display you can turn off if you don't want to see the bottom traces for example you turn those off and now you're only looking at the top traces all right <clears throat> so um, display uh, whoops bottom and you can turn that back on <clears throat> all right what if we want some of the traces to be thicker right like these are power traces I might want them to be thicker thicker the change command has a lot of functionality. You type in change and look at all these things that I can adjust. All right, <clears throat> I want to change the um, size for uh, for traces. I believe the default is set at 0 0.07. Well, let's just check that. 0 0.076. I'll change this. Um, you know what? That wasn't the right. Uh, I meant to do width. Sorry. Change width. The default is. 16 thousandths or 16 mil um, for your uh, for your width that's 16 uh, thousandths of an inch and um, I can in increase that so let's say these are power traces I want to make them thicker so I can just go through and, and make them thicker like this right these all are running for power I want to make them nice and thick all right, so then the question comes up is, well, can't I have Eagle do that for me automatically and know that this is a power trace and just make it as thick as I want it? It sure can. So we'll, um, we'll undo that. By the way, actually, if I wanted to route this myself, the rip up command rips up traces, and I can rip up certain legs of a trace that's been run. So I could route this myself if I wanted to. Let's see what that looks like. <clears throat> type in the route command. It's just like wire. And now I can start to connect. All right, look, I have these same kinds of configurations I told you about. We can do this, this kind of curvy thing. Why don't we do that just for fun? I can choose the width. I can choose the width. Let's make it sort of unnecessarily huge. Um, all right, so I've now run that connection. Um, let's, let's route again. And I'll, I'll, I'll do something like this. Let's, let's go for um, something like that. I'm going to do this here just to show what happens. I'm going to route to here. Notice I'm on blue, so I'm on the bottom. Now I can go up here and change the layer up to top. Now I'm on the top, right? And oops. Uh, sure. Why not? We'll do it like that. And then what's got to happen right here for this to occur? something called a via, which is um, a way for the trace to run from here to here via from the bottom to the top. It's a punch through. 
you don't solder anything in this location, but it's a plated through drilled hole that provides connectivity from the bottom trace to the top trace. Okay? <clears throat> so you can route by hand if you want to. And sometimes you'll you'll need to or want to, because you can either either the auto router can't do something that you look at it and you say, well, that's really easy to route. I could do that. Let me just do it. Or um, you could do a better job than the auto router can. So that's there for you. If you want to rip up all connections, you type in rip up and click the go command. It asks you to rip up all symbols and you say yes. And you're back to all air wires. <clears throat> Let's take a look at something called defining nets. In the schematic, I can come over here and I can look at, uh, and you can do this in, in the board as well, but I want to do it in the schematic. Something called net classes. And when you pull up the net classes, you can choose the, um, the default class. It says that it's the width is zero mils, the drill is zero mils, and the clearance is zero mils. That's not accurate at all. Um, the width we saw default was 16 mil. Um, the drill, I don't remember exactly what it is. That's the size of the hole that it makes on vias and that sort of thing. The clearance is how much room it has around it from other traces. So, you know, this trace needs to have X amount of clearance Things shouldn't get near it. You can specify that. We're going to make one called um, plus 15. I'm going to make a new net called plus 15. I'm going to make that uh, the the width of that. I'm going to make it 40 mils instead of 16 mils. Yes. I'm going to make the drill. I don't know 30. Uh, I don't know 20 or something. And the clearance as um, 15 mils. I don't know, I'm just throwing some numbers out there. We do that. And then if I want to change, uh, let's see, I can change the class. I can change the class to this, and then I go and click on this here. I've changed the class of this, this net here to plus 15. All right, so you can check that by typing in info, clicking on the net, and it'll show you the net class is plus 15. All right, what if I want to make another one called power? We can come in here and go net classes. I'll make one called PWR. I'm going to make it 60 mils with 20 mils and 20 mils of drill or 20 mils of clearance or something. And I want to change class to power. Click on all these. I want all this stuff to be power in, in this one as well. I think that's almost all of our traces at this point, but maybe, maybe not this one here. All right, so, and not the ground traces yet. So we'll save that, and then when I come over here, back to the board, and I auto route this, and I click OK, you can see that now my power traces that I've defined are really thick. And this one, this is ground. All the ground traces are really thin, right? Because I didn't specify their thickness. Uh, I only specified that I wanted plus 15 to have this certain width. And then you can see the power traces, the ones I designed as power, were um, set up on the input. And they were a little little higher, right? So <clears throat> I want the ground traces to be thicker. And in fact, I want to show you a technique that is even better than having thick ground traces. It's called having a ground pour. Um, so this, this technique involves taking the entire unused space on the bottom of the board and making it all ground. And it's a very useful technique. Um, it uh, it's, it's affords lower noise uh, because all voltages present in the circuit are relative to ground, right? So if you minimize the ground trace resistance, that is, make the ground conductor as big as possible, uh, you minimize voltage offset and therefore uh, noise because <clears throat> the offset can come in as you know, uh, noise from either EMI or, or power supply noise and that sort of thing. Classic 60 hertz hum. So uh, we, we'll, we'll talk about making a ground pour right now. And it's pretty simple to do. We'll rip up all the commands. I'm going to draw a polygon on here. So I'll say draw poly. Um, no, I think draw is... A, I really? Okay. I'll use the drop-down menu and say draw polygon. And 
look, I can choose the layer I want it to be on. I want it to be on the bottom. You can make a plane on the top or a pour on the top, but I'm going to make mine on the bottom. And I don't really want my, I don't need my line to be that thick. We're going to fill it all in anyways, so let's just do this. And we'll, we'll make it a little bit, uh, we'll have it a little bit of geometry to it or something. Uh, why not? Just, uh, let's, sure. Uh, <laughs> why not? Okay, great. <clears throat> We're, we're having fun in here. This is, we're just exploring our artistic side outside of engineering a little bit, or inside of engineering. All right, so we've got a, we've got a polygon, right? And, um, and now I can name this polygon, I can name it to be a net, um, a signal. Actually, let's, before I do that, let's go back here. I want to show you, uh, oh, actually, I might not have named this ground yet, actually. Um, let's type in info. And if I click on this, oh yeah, the name, the net name is ground. By, by using this ground symbol, it automatically has given this, anything that it's connected to this symbol, a net name of ground. The other nets have just numeric names like this. This is net N4, right? So this is similar to P-Spice. Um, the ones connected to ground have this ground name already. This is great because now I could come over here and change the name of my polygon. I'll type in name, I'll click on the polygon. It says, a new name for this polygon. You wanna do it for this polygon or the entire signal, you choose this polygon and you name it capital G N D. Type okay. This is now, this polygon is now connected to ground. And when I type in auto now, this polygon can fill with ground anywhere that there is unused space. So I type in auto, I set it to go, and check it out. I've got my whole thing filled, and anywhere that needed to connect to ground, like this capacitor, it just punches through, the, the, the lead punches through, and then there's a small cross mark here that connects into the huge you know, ocean of ground on the bottom here. <laughs> so. Um, the LED, same thing, that sort of thing. You can specify a number of things about this polygon, like how much space is around. See this, this lead right here, this punches through, but it doesn't, you don't want it to connect to ground, so you need um, sort of a moat around it. And um, you can specify how thick you want that to be. So I think if you just go to, um, you type in info, and you click on the polygon, Here's all the things you can change about the polygon. Um, you can do, you can change the pore. If you don't want solid, you can do something called hatched, which people use sometimes. I, I, I just use the solid. Hatched does kind of like a, uh, a crisscross formation on it. Um, the spacing and the isolate is the parameter that uh, adjusts how much white space or, or how much of a moat you have around these parameters here. So, it says the default is zero. Again, that's not, that's not what it is. It's, it's something different than that. Um, I think it, it might be 16 mil again. I'm not sure. Let's set it to something large so we can see what it looks like. So I'll hit OK, and you can see now I have much more space around these things. You may not need to do that, but, uh, but you have the option. It's available to you. All right, so I'm actually, I didn't write this on the instructions yet, but I am going to require you to do this for your project. One, because it's a really good skill to learn. It's, it's not that difficult. And, um, and two, you'll get better performance out of your design. Three, it makes routing the whole board much easier because now you don't have to run ground traces all over your whole board. You just tap in to the unused ground space, the, the, the filled ground pour area here. You get a, a more efficient layout. And, uh, and you know, so it's, there, there are multiple reasons to do this. And... Um, and I'd like you to learn how to do it. So I'm going to make it um, part of the, one of the requirements for the project. All right. So there's a lot of other stuff that you can go through and keep looking at in Eagle. Uh, I don't know if there's any other real critical things that you should, should see right at the moment. Um, Yeah, I, I don't think there's really anything else I want to I want to show you right at the moment. So if you have other questions, as uh, as the um, 
project progresses as you start working on it. And again, start working on it soon. Start, start just playing around with the schematic editor and layout and stuff like that. Uh, you have, what, six weeks from today? Or just about six weeks from today? So, um, so get started early. Uh, it'll, it'll only be much harder to, to, to balance with the rest of your load as you start hitting midterms and things like that. Don't get caught trying to do this one week before the project happens. You won't, you won't have time to do a good, good design. You got a question? The schematic, uh, we're just basically doing the same schematic. Right? You're going to copy what is already put in there. I made that schematic in Eagle, too. So um, it doesn't have to look exactly like it. Like Ian had asked earlier about the European-style caps versus the US caps. Whatever your cap looks like, just as long as it um, it fits the package that you are going to yeah, use. Yeah, our, our stuff, yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I did want to show you one other thing, actually. Let's rip this up real quick. And, uh, <clears throat> and remember, I wanted to show you how to change the package of a part. Let's say that these resistors, they're, too, they're taking up too much space being laid down horizontally, horizontally like this. I want to change their package um, to, oh, great. Um, to uh, to something different. So I type in change package, and I think I can actually even type R7, and it'll 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 know that I want to do it for R7. And so now I have all the packages available that I could choose. And instead of this 10 millimeter thing, I'm going to go for one of the uh, for one of the vertical packages. Uh, 2075 uh, 2V right here like this. So I hit OK. And I say, good, I'm good to go. Same thing, I want to do the same thing for this one. Good to go. And now, now the, the package has changed. and taken up a lot more, a lot less board space. All right? So if you go through and later on you find you have a different capacitor or something like that, and you can come through and click on that and try to uh, look for one that's going to fit your, your cap. If you can't find a cap for some reason that's satisfying this, let me know. I might even... I might even put a, at thinking about it in advance, I might even put a cap in that library as well in case you're running into any issues with that. But, but try and let me know if any of you run into an, an issue with uh, finding a package for a cap that matches what you need to put on there from what you bought. Uh, let me know as soon as possible and I can make sure that you have that access accessible. All right. <clears throat> so this, this black border that you've drawn, is that the actual physical dimensions of the board that we'll get? It is. So there's no extra perimeter or anything like that. With them. There is not. There is the the dimensions of this board are exactly the size that you'll get back. Uh, do we need to leave space for the holes on these? You do. Uh, and by the way, you add those. You can add stuff in on the board package. Go to the holes library. Whoops. And um, you want a 440 hole has a 2.8 millimeter diameter. So you'll put them on like this. Okay, so you notice they take up a fair amount of space. Um, so, so three inches square isn't really a whole lot to work with. All right, if I route it now that I've done that, um, it'll it'll leave space around those holes as well. Okay. Does Eagle have any issue with with uh, parts overlapping aside like if if they're their solder pads aren't overlapping, will it like give you an error? Or it will not. So you can you can place this stuff, like I can I can um, let's rip this up here. <clears throat> uh, you can place them all like this and Eagle won't won't tell you that uh, you're gonna be screwed later. <laughs> I was just thinking, is the, the indicator LED that you use is typically mounted on the chassis or the that you use. It is, and that's a good point to bring up, is that um, your LED and your potentiometer and your power switch and the jacks and stuff like that don't sit on the board. They, are, they mount into the enclosure, and wires from the solder leads or the solder tabs on those parts then go to the board, right? So you don't have to put in... You don't have to use up this much space of your of your board layout to put an LED there because it's not actually going to take up that much space. You really only need these holes there. So if you want to um, 
to instead, like let's say uh, you could come here, I can go to the schematic and I can, uh, I can delete this. And remember, I have the board open, so it's okay to do this. I delete it here and then the reflection is made in the board, right? If I did that with, with one of the files closed, I lose consistency and then Eagle gets angry. Um, so uh, we add in, if you want to do something like that where you don't want to take up that much space, use the pinhead library which um, just allows you to put pins, or like holes, on your, on your board. For, for non-large power connections, like lighting an LED or, or sending audio output or some, well, audio input at least, your audio output, you might want on, on thicker, bigger holes, but <clears throat> for driving headphones and things like that. Uh, but uh, for small, lower, lower current connections, um, you can use these pinheads and this, see that places this nice small little pinhead junction there, and you can just you can just put that there. You can put it in place. It doesn't look like an LED. Um, you can type in net and then connect these things here, like that, and uh, and now you just have to remember that an LED goes here. So maybe you'll write your write some text that that reminds you to stick an LED there, and then uh, and then go over to the board and put that wherever you need to. Um, you might also write some text on the board that reminds you that's an LED or something like that. <clears throat> you can, uh, for the line in jacks, it'd be fine because they're low current. Um, the headphone jacks, they're 600 ohm coils most, most of the time. Um, you might want a little bit more. I mean, this would probably be fine, honestly. It'll probably be fine if you wanted something with a little more um, <clears throat> ampacity. You could put in something like uh, this. I use. I recommend this for power connections as well. Um, connectors, Phoenix, and you want the 350. So these are terminal blocks, and. Um, you add them in. You add them in wherever you want. You connect stuff to them, but then just look in this, look in the board, and see you get uh, they're spaced 3.5 millimeters apart. That was from the Connectors Phoenix um, library. These are readily available on Mauser and DigiKey. It's a standard type. It's a terminal block, so you place this here, and then there's actually um, it's a solderless connection, which is nice for jacks and things like that. If a jack fails, then you have a way of changing the jack without having to solder the board because a uh, terminal block goes here which has small set screws which cr cr uh, crimp or clamp down on the cables that you um, that you put into the uh, into the holes in the terminal block okay so that's you know I recommend that for higher higher current um, connections the, again I think you'd probably be fine with with this if you're running out of board space this takes up a lot of board space here um, so you might not want to do that. So is, um, as far as minimizing noise, are there specific parts of this circuit that we should isolate from other parts? Uh, do you have any recommendations? <clears throat> that? Um, I would just try and keep the, I mean, you're putting it all into a pretty small area. I would just try to keep the power supply to one section and then build the channels in their own Kind of section. Um, try and keep, try and keep the channels. Try and try and separate the board so that you have one channel on kind of one half of the board and the other channel on one half of the board. Try to minimize the traces from left and right channels crossing over each other and things like that. You'll minimize crosstalk from the right channel information to the left channel information. It's probably not a lot that's going to happen with that. With um, you know. The only way that's going to happen is kind of like mutual inductance or capacitance between traces. But, uh, and so that's not, I, I'd say all that likely, but, uh, but still just. Is that when they're just overlapping on both sides of the board, like they're parallel? Yeah, for long parallel lengths. So if they do cross, if they need to cross, try and, try and do that as much as possible. Any other questions? All right, I'm going to. Um, conclude this um, this tutorial, at least the video recording portion of it, because uh, was, I'm out of battery, but I'm also going to plug in here, but um, just because this is getting really long.